Downtown, if you want to play, you have to pay. It's really irritating. For Jim Dadakis, that means feeding the meter, then playing a game of beat the clock. Uh, I'm going to go in, have lunch, come out, put another couple quarters in, go back, enjoy my lunch. Like Dadakis, most Phoenicians play by the rules. When they get a ticket, they usually pay it. Red meter expired. Last year, Phoenix traffic enforcement officers issued more than 130,000 parking tickets. Uh, he's parked in a no parking area. Which the city eventually collected more than two million dollars. He's blocking the sidewalk. Lulu Rumble says most people cooperate when it comes to parking. At 2214 North 74. But there are others who show no respect at all. They yell, they scream, they cuss at you. This is a list of the unpaid parking tickets in the city of Phoenix. There are more than 46,000 entries on this list. That's enough to fill almost every seat in Bank One Ballpark. It's a long list and there are lots of people on it, including one of the most powerful men in Arizona. The House will please come to order. Jeff Grosskost is Speaker of the House. His three unpaid tickets have been out so long, the city turned them over to a collection agency. Parking in downtown Phoenix. He said he had no idea he was on the list until we told him. How does the Speaker of the House end up on the boot and toll list? <laughs> well, I guess you have business downtown in Phoenix where they have horrendous parking and uh, those silly 30-minute meters. I certainly am no stranger to parking tickets. However, I've got to tell you, I, as a general rule, pay them on time. Gross cost has since paid his tickets, but there are others on this list who may never pay, including one guy whose tickets take up five whole pages. He's the city's worst offender. His name is Eugene Huff. For years, he's been thumbing his nose at the city, refusing to pay on 320 tickets he's racked up. He's not here. And refusing our request for an interview. Mr. Huff, can we talk to you? We're from Channel 15. I want to talk to you about your parking ticket, sir. Sir, you have over $13,000 worth. So how do all these people get away with not paying their parking ticket? Maybe because they know this. No one from the city will ever call you or knock on your door. If you get pulled over, police officers are not going to arrest you for unpaid parking tickets because they don't show up on your criminal record. And you'll have no problem renewing your driver's license. The MVD won't even blink. I think parking tickets are a joke. Gary Peter Clark is a former city council member. He says the reason there are tens of thousands of unpaid tickets clogging the system is because failure to pay parking tickets is not considered a criminal offense. I'm one of the few suckers who pays these things every time, well, and I had no idea that there were you know, 46,000 people who didn't. For someone who's not worried about a bad credit rating, why should they pay their parking tickets? There's no reason at all, and that's got to change. Oh, such a good girl. Oh, boy. Hey, Missy, you want a biscuit? Gladys Hogue is like most grandmothers. She loves her dog, <laughs> is proud of her kids. And those are my, my boys. She important. saves everything. I'm sentimental, very sentimental. Gladys recently rediscovered something she put in a drawer long ago. It was a letter, a rejection letter from the game company Parker Brothers. This is when Bill was on the fire department back in Newark, Ohio. You see, Gladys's late husband, Bill, was a dreamer. In 1955, he had sent Parker Brothers his proposal for a dice game he called Yowie. Gladys recently noticed that a popular game with a very similar name came out about the same time, in the 1950s. It made Gladys wonder about this game, Yahtzee. She took a good hard look at this game and was amazed to find that Yahtzee and her late husband's idea for Yowie are very similar. Everything is the same. The rules are the same. The game is the same. The counting is the same. And it's not fair. To prove it, Gladys showed us the original score sheet Mr. Hogue drew up at their kitchen table 53 years ago. Look closely. Yahtzee's score sheet is almost identical in the way it's laid out, in the way the columns are arranged. Identical in the exact number of bonus points a player needs, 63. And the exact number of bonus points awarded, 35. In the Hoag's game, five of a kind is called a Yowie. In the other game, it's called, you guessed right, a Yahtzee. 
and it gets better. The rejection letter from Parker Brothers is dated March 15, 1956. The News 15 investigators studied trademark records. They show just one month after the hoax Yowie was rejected by Parker Brothers, another company filed for ownership on a game it called Yahtzee. The ES Low Company once operated out of the same building as Parker Brothers. Gladys wonders if someone inside Parker Brothers leaked her husband's idea. Gladys' husband had intellectual property. Okay, somebody stole that from her. Patent attorney Gladys Albert Smyzer says Gladys has a good case. Uh, Gladys is not a greedy person or anything like that. My grandchildren and my children deserve something from this because this was their grandfather that did this. Lawyers for Hasbro, which now owns E.S. Lowe and Parker Brothers, responded, writing, We do not know how we could begin to reconstruct what happened over 42 years ago. Some of the pertinent witnesses have passed away or have moved on to places unknown. Well, I'm still alive, and I haven't moved to places unknown. And our Paul Johnson found the startling evidence that a dying man is telling the truth. And it appears the government is looking the other way. It started mushrooming like a big mushroom, huge. And it really scared us. We thought the world had come to an end. After that historic moment at Bikini Atoll, the U.S. military moved in to retrieve test animals and get a closer look at the incredible damage. Donald Lawrence was 18 at the time and says he was one of those men who went on board ghost ships anchored offshore. The rats got loose and in the explosion, the cages busted open and the rats were running all over the ships. And I went below the Salt Lake City. It was real scary. You could shine your light up on a beam and there'd be a big rat up there. The rats didn't get Donald that day, but now the radiation has. 52 years after Operation Crossroads, Donald Lawrence is plagued by skin cancer, polyps, bleeding ulcers and cataracts. And I've almost died three different times. Doctors here at the VA Medical Center have confirmed that some of Donald's medical problems are consistent with exposure to radiation. But for years, the Navy has denied Donald's application for compensation. The reason? Official records indicate that Donald Lawrence's ship wasn't anywhere near the test site when the bomb went off. For 43 years, he's been trying to convince the military he was there. But Donald Lawrence's word, even his medical reports, have not been enough. He felt like giving up, letting the military win. You got any food here, Don? Run, yeah. where's your fish food? But Donald you know keeps I mean? fighting for his boys, sons from a late-in-life marriage. Since their mother left the family, Donald has been raising them himself. He thinks he's going to be... Sailor like he's dead. Sea monkey. Then, when he was at his lowest point, Donald had an epiphany. It happened the day he took his sons to the library. He was strolling the aisles of the library one day when he made a discovery. It was a book about the military that he'd never seen before. He opened it up, and right there, to his astonishment, was the proof that he'd been looking for for so many years. It was an old picture showing a group of men aboard one of those radiated ships in Operation Crossroads. They're scrubbing the deck. And there, on the left, in the back, is an 18-year-old sailor, Donald Lawrence. He's supervising the group. Oh, I jumped up there. I got on that phone and I called that commander and I said, by heck, it is me. Donald thought he'd finally won, but the government still had questions, like, is that crew really on a radiated ship? And is this really Donald Lawrence? That's when we did something the Navy had not. Donald gave us names, shipmates he hadn't spoken to in 50 years. Most were impossible to find. But then, after several days of striking out, we got lucky. We found this man, 69-year-old Otis Johnson, in Taylor's South Carolina. I, I believe he was in charge of this group. 
Mr. Johnson didn't know it at the time, but Donald Lawrence's benefits, possibly his children's future, rested on what this old sailor could remember about a 52-year-old picture. Well, uh, all I can say, we were there. We were there. That, that's great. That's great. You know, he's proven my point. Now, I don't know how they can lie out of this. But even with the new evidence, the VA is still shuffling papers, saying Donald Lawrence will have to file an appeal. According to the Navy, the deck logs from Don's ship are the only official record, and the deck logs say nothing about men from Don's ship going aboard a radiated ship. But just last week, we located another former shipmate. We found him in Southern California, and 70-year-old Edward Manis told us Donald's story is absolutely true. What's sad about this, Robin, is even after informing the VA of this new evidence, they haven't made any effort to contact any of Donald's shipmates to confirm the story. They say the burden of the proof is on the veteran, but in Donald's physical condition, it's next to impossible for him to search the country, so we'll keep looking. I've got a good feeling he's gonna get his money soon.